Peter. Good to be with you again this evening. We began the first evening laying a foundation in terms of the meaning and purpose of marriage and spent most of our time looking at um, Genesis 1 and 2 and to understand that marriage is really at the center uh, and has a very important role in um, funding and energizing uh, our role as image bearers of God and his rule over his world uh, and to do so um, in a way that reflects his character, his goodness, his mercy, his love and the intense intimacy of marriage is at the, at the center of that as we uh, have children and raise children um, and then last night we looked at uh, and I shared a good bit of my own story, uh, ways in which the enemy seeks to disconnect uh, and to separate uh, our relationships with one another, with the Lord, uh, even our relationship to ourselves and to the earth. And as this alienation um, begins to corrupt and to pollute and to distort what it means to uh, bear God's image in the world. And uh, and yet how the Lord from the very beginning, uh, his strategy was not to just uh, wipe the slate clean and to say, uh, I'm going to give up on humankind. Uh, he did start over with Noah, but he started over with the same program. Uh, he brought us back to the same storyline. Um, and that's the way God's judgment is. There might be uh, a disciplinary uh, part of God's judgment, but his discipline is really about restoration. It's about bringing us back to the original storyline. And God does that primarily through covenant making, is what we looked at last night, and uh, to reconnect. Uh, and so reconnecting, we spent a good bit of time talking about how to do that in terms of listening and in terms of uh, saying four things. We talked about the importance of saying thank you in our marriages, uh, in our worship, in our relationship to God, uh, the importance of being able to say uh, something's wrong here, things aren't the way they're supposed to be. We experience that every day, and uh, it's a challenge sometimes to be able to communicate that in our marriages, in our churches, and that's part of what we're going to be looking at tonight, is sort of asking the question, uh, how are we going? How are we going at supporting those who are experiencing marital crisis? How well are we walking with them through that? Uh, it's not a short-term crisis. It's a long-term crisis. Uh, and that presents uh, unique challenges in our lives because we're all busy. We're all feeling the pressure uh, in our lives. And so part of what we're going to talk about is how do we shepherd families, not just the couple that's experiencing the trauma, but how do we shepherd families, children also that are experiencing uh, the trauma of marital crisis? So that's what we're focused on this evening. So the four things we looked at in reconnecting are thank you, um, something's wrong here, it's not the way it's supposed to be, I'm sorry, and then let's begin again. So that's what we looked at last night. I shared a bit of my own story. And I'm very excited about tonight. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. And uh, Steve, I'm just wondering why I don't have a picture up here. Do I, oh, I see. Oh, here we go. I just need to open the window. Got to open the window, and then we're good. <coughs> Shepherding, who... And how? I just want to take a few minutes at the beginning uh, to see how both in the Old and the New Testament, uh, the Lord focuses our attention on both who we're to shepherd and how we're to shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, we have uh, in verse 4, we'll just take this passage, the weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, 
and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or to seek for them. So the prophet brings a word of judgment, uh, warning and judgment against the shepherds of Israel. Uh, and it has particularly to do with their failure to focus on the weak, to go after the lost, to bind up the broken heart. <clears throat> so it seems as though it's very important um, that we uh, pay attention and have ways in our churches to bring to our attention when people are hurting. And so one of the things, one of the questions I want us to consider tonight is how have we structured our shepherding? How do we go about it? What's the process? And does the process, is it conducive? Is it doing its job of uh, sort of being, you know how on your, on your car you have the dashboard lights? And they're supposed to tell you when there's a problem, right? But the red light's supposed to come on. Do we have a dashboard in the way that we have uh, organized shepherding in the church to help us know when people are hurting? Now, of course, it's uh, people's responsibility to step forward as well. They have a responsibility to ask for help. And we don't want to diminish that. And that's very important that people reach out for help. It's, uh, it's the beginning of getting better. But also we need to be sure that we're structuring our ministries in ways that we're close enough to hear their cries. <clears throat> that we can, um, that we've made the place a safe place where people can feel as though they can ask for help. I grew up in the church, and I'll just have to say that not all the churches that I was a part of were safe places. There were a few of them where actually a lot of energy was expended to communicate, we have it all together. Um, and that was sort of the overriding ethos of the, of the community. Uh, we're the community that has it together, right? Uh, and yet the church is more like a hospital. It's more like the sense of those who need the grace of God and know that we need God's grace. And we see that in this word from the prophets right from the beginning is that we are to be, uh, make ourselves in a position where we can hear the cries of the weak and go after the weak. Uh, but look also in uh, Luke 15, of course, when Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep, he says, right, you have 99 and the one, you go after the one, right? And then you bring the one back on your shoulders and you rejoice. And then it says that the angels rejoice in heaven over that, the repentance of that one, right? Uh, so there's again, Jesus, I think, is, is echoing Exodus 34. He's picking up on the warning of the prophets there. But turn with me to John chapter 10, just for a moment, because I think John 10, and I'm sure that I could learn a lot from you tonight about shepherding. Uh, this great country you have is... Uh, built on the back of sheep, I think. And uh, there's a lot of understanding about sheep. Uh, John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. It says here that the one who enters by the door, verse 2, is the shepherd. He didn't climb over the wall. He comes through the door. To him the gatekeeper opens. Why does he, why does he open the gate? Why? Because he knows who he is. <clears throat> he knows him, right? He says, um, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all that, he, uh, that are his own, he goes before him, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Brothers and sisters, I want to say tonight 
thankfully this is not true of every experience, but it's happened too often, that men and women who are going through marital <coughs> crisis flee the discipline process, flee encounters with pastors. Why? Because they're strangers. They don't know them well. They don't know the elders well. They're too distant. They're not close enough. They're not real enough, right? There's not that intimacy of knowing their character, of knowing their voice, of knowing and remembering all those times when maybe they came around and they were involved in helping them in some other way. If you have that kind of knowledge where people have been to the hospital with you, they've, they've helped you with your kids, that uh, we've had people coming alongside, well then when there's a marital crisis, they won't flee. Usually they won't flee. There's relational capital just like in a family, when a parent needs to discipline a child, the discipline is more effective, right, because of how much love there's been there, about how much support there's been there. The effectiveness of discipline in our families is built on all the positive times. It's built on the nurture. And that's the way it's supposed to work in God's family as well, is that the discipline experience, in terms of marital breakdown, the chance of success is directly proportional to how nurtured they have felt. It, how much positive discipline has there been? Before we get to the need to sanction, the need to confront, the need to admonish. And there is a need to do that. But if we admonish, if we sanction, when there's not that history of nurture, when there aren't the, the sheep pens where people get fed and cared for, right? Then people flee. They flee like someone who doesn't know the shepherd's voice because they don't know the shepherd's voice very well. Or the shepherd's voice is very harsh like we read about in Ezekiel 34. So tonight, I want us to consider shepherding in ways that we plan and point to shepherding places and pathways. I want to just particularly talk to the elders of the church a little bit tonight to say it's our responsibility to create the places and the pathways and to communicate the places and the pathways. It might be a small group ministry, a discipling ministry, it might be a mom's prayer group or play group. But we create the structures where there's nurture, where people can get to know the shepherd's voices. I've been involved in a lot of larger churches in North America, and it's a bigger challenge there because people just kind of get on a list. And they might get a phone call from an elder, but they don't really know their elder. And so when trouble comes, it's really tough, right? So I want to just take a moment to share a little bit about uh, one way in which we structured a ministry in Atlanta uh, and communicated where people were cared for, where they can become known, and also how we cultivated leadership, how we raised up uh, leaders in the church to care for them. Now, it's not the only way to do it, but I think there's, by showing a particular way, I think it will maybe communicate some principles um, that might be helpful, or at least some that maybe we can talk about. So everyone comes to worship. It's a place to confess, a place to lament, to bear witness, and to celebrate. And I just want to tell you that um, the experience of worship, when you have someone who is able to ask for prayer about their marriage, or when you have someone who might give a testimony in a worship service about how God has helped them that day, 
or how God has brought them maybe through a period of separation or struggle in their marriage. When people hear what God is doing in their lives or has done in their lives in a, in a situation like that, it changes the culture of the church. It's safe now. I can tell people that I'm struggling with the same thing. And so that was a big change for our church. We were kind of an all-together church. And I had a meeting with the senior pastor to talk about the beginning of a ministry called Fresh Start, a divorce recovery ministry. And I said, Bob, are you prepared for the culture of our church to change? And he said, we need for it to change. We are just two together. And we all know that that's not the true story, that on the inside we're aching, we're hurting, our marriages are are struggling. We've all got the same sorts of problems. We just don't feel safe to talk about it. So one of the things that started happening in worship is that we began to ask people to give testimonies. Testimonies about times of separation. Testimonies about, about their divorce and how the Lord worked in their life uh, in that process. And then it became a place where people felt like they could approach the shepherds and they could talk to them, they could approach it and uh, feel safe about talking about their lives. So that's one thing that began to change there. And another thing that was really important, I think, was uh, the pastors and the elders. And, and see, I have women leaders up there. Uh, we had a very active small group ministry, and the elders of the church were very clear that the women small group leaders were very important in this whole process. And so we began to practice something a little bit differently and in the service we would let people know that after the service the pastors, the elders, and some of the women leaders would be available just to meet people. We had a little side room off the uh, sanctuary. We had tea, had coffee, and people could meet them. And they might get an invitation to a small group. They might get an invitation to a women's Bible study. Uh, some people, though, wanted, especially in the evening services, some people wanted <coughs> prayer. And they would talk right there and wanted to ask for prayer. It was really important that there were women leaders there and not just men, for women to feel safe to talk to people, too. And the women leaders were carrying out their ministry, not on their own, but under the leadership of the session, under the leadership of, of the elders. They were doing it together, right? Creating a safe place, a place to uh, be able to share. Uh, we had uh, the first, notice where these arrows, uh, one of the first opportunities we would encourage people to get um, involved in the church deeper were our home fellowships. These were groups of about 30, uh, once they got to 30, we would, we would start a new one. Uh, 20 to 30, we'd start a new one. Uh, but it was an easy sort of midweek time where people could come and um, there'd be a time of fellowship. Uh, some of the home fellowship groups would share a meal uh, once a month. Uh, it was just relaxed atmosphere, you know, a home Bible study group. But that was really a central structure for us for our shepherding. Uh, we had elders involved in each one of the groups. So elders and their wives, and then deacons were also assigned uh, to those groups. And those were places, too, that we would send our new small group leaders twice a year. So in the beginning of the school year, uh, and then after the holiday, after the Christmas break, twice a year the small group leaders would go and would talk about their small groups starting up and invite people to come. And the small groups were groups of three to six, and they were more discipleship oriented. Uh, they were more really kind of beginning to, um, you know, to, to grow or to heal. So that's the third level here is the small groups. And this is where uh, we had uh, discipleship, but we also had recovery groups. You see that word there, recovery. So in the discipleship groups, there were three different kinds of groups that were the smaller groups, the three to six groups. They were, uh, we called them covenant groups. Those were discipleship. They tended to be 
uh, all male or all female, right? Uh, the married couples would mainly stay in the home fellowship groups. So we had, um, <coughs> excuse me, couples would go as couples to the home fellowship group, but married and single men and married and single women would uh, disciple one another, right? So we had the older women discipling the younger women, older men discipling the younger men, that, that principle from Timothy. Um, but the three types of groups were discipleship, we also had ministry teams that would take a break from um, the discipleship program and would get involved with a particular ministry of the church and they'd like commit that for a quarter. They might be involved with the deacons. Uh, they might be involved with our city ministries. Uh, they might be involved with our international students. So we had people sort of rotate and say, hey, we're gonna serve for a quarter. But then when we started Fresh Start, we had recovery groups and these were people in smaller <laughs> groups who were going through the experience of separation or divorce and um, that's what that's where they would be so notice that we have then um, disciplers mentor couples and shepherds that were involved with the small groups so those would be women shepherds or men shepherds right but they would be then responsible to an elder, right, who was over about three or four of those small group leaders. So that's sort of how we had it organized. Uh, the principle there that I, that, uh, I want to talk about in terms of John 10 is its organic relationships. There was a, a place where they met regularly uh, so that natural relationships could develop. It wasn't sort of just being called off a list. They were getting together once a week. They were getting involved in each other's lives, right? And so there were natural relationships that formed. Places, and then we would point to the pathways. So we would tell people when they were joining the church, here's how we're structured. We have a home fellowship opportunity. Uh, and then we also have our small group ministry. We expect you to be involved only twice a week, once at worship, and then either in a home fellowship or either in a small group. So we wanted them to make a commitment of two um, times a week is sort of how we would say it in our uh, new members class, right? And then um, what we started was then once every six weeks, the elders and deacons from the home fellowship groups and their group of shepherds, disciplers and mentor couples would all come to leadership community. And leadership community would happen once every six weeks, so about eight times a year, and we'd meet for two hours. And in the first hour, we would have a time of in-service training and testimony. And what we tried to do with the in-service training is uh, we would invite different types of people uh, to come. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, <coughs> But we'd also have a word of testimony. We wanted to hear what was going on in some of the groups. And we'd have a time for prayer. So it was a time of testimony to celebrate the little victories, uh, to encourage the people who were sacrificing their time, and to say, we, we thank you, we appreciate you, right? Uh, and then the second hour, we would break out into groups. And that's when these elders from the home fellowship groups they would meet with their shepherds and mentor couples in small groups of about eight to 12 people in the second hour. And they would talk about what's going on in the groups. And they would pray specifically for, the, for those groups, right? That's where we really keep account on what's happening, what's going on. So then, if there's marital crisis, if there's separation, um, if there's job loss, these kinds of things, then it's not a big surprise when that comes to the attention of the entire, uh, of the session, because we were there on the ground, we had a time, a regular time every six weeks to catch up with what was going on uh, in the groups. So it's just a principle of creating places, small groups, where elders, are then shepherding others under them, right? And they're getting together on regular basis 
to know what's going on in those groups and to pray uh, for those groups. And then there would, of course, be a regular report back to the elders meeting uh, once a month. Um, these lines here, and we'll go a little bit further, um, what we would, one of the in-service trainings we would do in leadership community was we had a resource manual of referrals. So the pastors had taken the time to develop relationships with the professional community. We had three different counseling centers that we were involved with, uh, most of which specialized in terms of marital issues, uh, career counseling, uh, parenting issues, things like that. We also had relationships with doctors, psychiatrists, or people who were wrestling with depression. Uh, and so the pastors took the time to vet those relationships, to, to find out what was really going on, to get referrals, and to meet with those people so that then we could make, uh, we could put them in our resource list and we could tell the leaders in leadership community, we trust these folks. Here's their phone number. You can, you can give their name out. You can call them. Um, so um, that's the professional community, and we could, people from uh, home fellowship groups or for small groups could make those referrals. I have attorneys down here because we had a couple of things come up in terms of legal matters. Um, um, adoption. A, a lot of couples were, were adopting, and uh, we found out about those who were doing private adoptions, and we uh, began to make a list of those kinds of things. Um, and then also just in terms of divorce, uh, we had relationships with Christian lawyers um, who wouldn't be quick about divorce. They were careful about that, uh, and we wanted to have a relationship with them. Um, and so we had some people that we were relating to there. The doctors were mainly uh, psychiatrists and pediatricians. We had so many kids in our uh, church, we kept a list of pediatricians just for information for people. Um, okay, so that's the structure, and you can see that this meeting here, once every six weeks, was a very important time then of uh, just getting to know the sheep, praying for the sheep, knowing what was uh, going on. Any questions about just this? It's a little bit complicated, but I thought I would put it up there. Principles of shepherding, creating places and creating pathways. People know where to go to get help. They know where to go to, to become known. Uh, we asked them to make a commitment to both the worship service and a smaller meeting so they could be known. Yes, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. of bringing those people more into right. the session for that would come, a wider thing. It would usually come to the pastors uh, yeah. through the elders. And what we did, one of the things I have here is, um, <coughs> oh, I think I put it on a, on a different slide. We developed a separate counseling ministry, and there's a similar principle here. Uh, we really wanted to encourage people uh, to come themselves, to share with their elder, right? So what we didn't what we didn't encourage was people sort of going and tattletaling, so to speak, right? Sure. What we wanted to do as a as an expression of growth, and also just to keep it as a safe place, was we wanted to encourage those who are small group leaders, right? Uh, if they had significant issues, just to relate to the person, be patient, confront them along Matthew 18. Uh, if someone has sinned against you, right, go to them. Um, and then have them talk to their elder. Have them talk to their discipleship uh, group leader. We wanted to start there, right? But then there might be a point if they're stepping back, if they're just con continuing to ignore, right, that you as, say, a women's discipleship group leader would need to say, have you talked to your elder yet after a good bit of time? Um, you would say, you know, we're going to need just to talk to them. I'll go with you, that sort of thing. So we try to do it that way 
and in terms of accountability, the need for both accountability, but also just the need for someone to, to grow and to take responsibility for themselves, keep it, keep it a safe place. Does that answer your question? No, it does. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit last night about just uh, different transitions in marriage and also transitions in crisis. Um, so in terms of premarital counseling, uh, we had a requirement of four to six sessions. Um, and there was an initial pastoral interview, but then there was a referral to a mentor couple. We developed a mentor couple ministry identifying. We tried to identify uh, at least one or two new couples each cycle. Uh, and that way the couples could take a break, you know, because you, you need a rest every once in a while. So we wanted to continue to train mentor couples. Um, and then after the mentor couple had those uh, sessions, they of course would make a recommendation about, about the situation. Uh, the couple was always free to call them, but then they made a one-year check-in. We had a one-year check-in policy. We wanted those who had, after they got married, to kind of come back and meet with the mentor couple uh, after, after a year. The second thing we did was establish regular pastoral counseling hours. Um, Tuesday nights were kind of a, a regular time that people could, could call and set appointments. Um, and we set up a separate board fee structure and confidentiality policy. Uh, and we hired counselors who might come to the church on Tuesdays. It, it grew from just Tuesday nights to Tuesday nights and Saturdays. Uh, so it sort of was, was a time. Uh, and then the other thing that we did with that board is it really helped us to develop partnerships for referrals. So we would have counselors from the three different counseling centers on our board, and then we had ready referrals. And we would, that was a wonderful resource because then we could bring those counselors to do like a marriage seminar for our leadership community. Um, and we'd have them uh, d involved in the mentor couple training. So it was just about continuing to, to develop a continuum of care uh, and resources uh, for support uh, during marital crisis. Uh, the last thing that was really important was we, we, we printed the resource manual and we took the time to really just continue to communicate from the front how people could get involved, where they could be known, how they could get help, and try to c cultivate this culture where, uh, that was safe where people could uh, uh, share their struggles. Now I want to just uh, go to the issue of crisis itself and <coughs> to look at separation. So we're going to spend a good bit of time in 1 Corinthians 7 this evening. Um, you know, separation in our culture... Um, in New Zealand, do you have such a thing as legal separation? Yeah, we have that in, uh, in the States as well. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul uses the word separation, but they really did not have a legal status in the Greco-Roman world of a separate condition of separation and then divorce. And so... Um, it's important to keep that in mind as we're sort of looking at 1 Corinthians 7. But there is uh, this idea, if you look at chapter 7, um, let's look at verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. There's a very clear depiction of mutual submission, which Paul talks about in Ephesians 5, but here uh, that this authority they have in each other's lives, right? Verse 5, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of control. So um, Paul acknowledges that separation 
and or abstinence by agreement for a limited time um, is something that could be viable if it's by agreement, right? And that the, the express purpose is some form of personal examination. It's a time of prayer. It's a time of searching one's own heart. The time of dealing, sort of bringing yourself to attention before God, looking at your own life. Uh, but notice that uh, it's to come together again, right? So I think there's a place in terms of shepherding people through a process of, of, of marital crisis where a structured separation can be an important tool. It can be a valuable tool. We see this in, in the way that Paul talks about this. But the two principles here are agreement and uh, that it's a limited time. And that the purpose is examination for coming back together again to, to enrich uh, the marriage. Now, there are other ways in which Paul talks about separation here in chapter 7. Uh, if you would uh, look with me here. He says uh, to the unmarried, uh, verse 10, to the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. And he's referring here to Jesus' own teaching on marriage in Matthew 19 and Mark 10. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. So we have to understand the cultural context. And Jesus is, is speaking in the same way in Matthew 19. The Pharisees come to him and they say, um, Moses said to give a certificate of divorce. Uh, can we do that for any cause? For any reason, right? So there's a very loose culture of divorce that both Jesus and Paul are ministering in. But it's very lopsided. It's very one-sided, right? Only the men can divorce. Women can't divorce, right? So it's really interesting that both Jesus and Paul emphasize the mutuality of marriage, emphasize the permanence of marriage, right? And it's interesting that both of them talk about how women have rights in marriage, too. That Jesus emphasizes that it's possible for the husband to commit adultery against his <coughs> wife. That was kind of unheard of in that situation. Uh, it was really about only if the wife committed adultery, then he could put her away, or for any, just about any reason, right? But both Jesus and Paul are talking about the mutuality. Not only should um, wives not divorce, but or not only can husbands divorce their wives, but wives can divorce their husbands for adultery, uh, according to Jesus in Matthew 19. But husbands shouldn't divorce their wives. It's not just a matter of wives being faithful. It's also a matter of husbands being faithful. So we see that uh, emphasis on the priority and permanence of marriage. Um, we have a little confusion here about separation that I mentioned earlier. The, this word to separate in verse 10 and the word to divorce in verse 11. Wife shouldn't separate. Husband shouldn't divorce. We also have in verse 15 this word separate again. If an unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. <coughs> um, pretty much the two verbs, corizo and aphiemi, are synonymous because divorce in the Greco-Roman culture, most of the time it just happened. It just happened when people left, right? Uh, sometimes it would be legalized by the courts. Uh, but most of the time, it had to do with people just separating from one another. So it's important to understand the Greco-Roman context and how that's somewhat different from our legal context. And yet in chapter 7, we do see that there is a place for separation that's mutually agreed upon as long as it's for the purpose of self-examination and to come back uh, together in the marriage. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we see here is that um, 
the ideal in the Christian community that Paul keeps coming back to in chapter 7 is reconciliation. Uh, so that's always the goal, is reconciliation. Uh, and that's both for women uh, and for men. That is the, the norm. However, in verse 11, we see that that doesn't always happen. That's not always the reality. Um, there's this idea here. Um, if she does separate, he's acknowledging that happens, verse 11, she should remain unmarried or be reconciled uh, to, her, to her husband, right? We also see this idea in verse 12. If a brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, this notion again of mutual consent, this is not a passive notion of consent. Uh, some translations have if she's willing to live with him. It's a very active sense of commitment, right? An active sense of, uh, of coming together. But Paul recognizes that that's not always the case, that, that that's not always the, uh, the reality. So are there biblical grounds uh, for divorce? Let's go back for a second to Matthew 19. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 7 because we're going to be coming back there. So in the Gospels, the Pharisees make a reference to Deuteronomy 24 where Moses talks about that it's lawful to divorce one's <coughs> wife and they just ask the question in verse 3, uh, for any reason. <coughs> and Jesus answers, well, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife? and they shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said, then why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And so uh, what we have here is um, a couple of things that are really interesting. The law regulates divorce. The law allows for divorce. But that is not the ideal. We have this picture here, if, if you just think about this for a second, of because it's true in the New Testament as well, that the law of God, the <coughs> order of God, does two things for us. It provides a ceiling that we're supposed to reach for, right? And it also provides a floor to sort of control the damage because of our hardness of heart. A ceiling to reach for and a floor to help control the damage because of the hardness of heart. So here's the, the thing we hear in the great commandment, right, is uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, I mean just, let me just ask you, I mean, does that make you feel all warm and fuzzy if, uh, if my husband or wife, you know, just avoids adultery? Does that necessarily mean a good marriage? Now, that's more like the floor, right? That's kind of the floor. We don't want to fall below that, right? But that's not the ceiling. That's not the ideal, right? The ceiling we want, to we want to reach for is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, right? So that's what we have. We have sort of the, the law of God is like a house, and it gives us both a ceiling that we're aspiring towards, the ideal, as it was in the beginning, the one flesh relationship. But then it also allows for and provides for the <coughs> fact that that isn't the way things are because of the hardness of our hearts. So we have those two principles. 
So Jesus taught that men could also be guilty of adultery uh, against their wives and that from the beginning the one flesh union is intergendered and it's a violation by either partner and that that's a serious rupture. Um, it's really interesting that Jesus says the reason for marriage has to do with God making us male and female from the beginning. Did you notice that? He says, um, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother in verse 5. What is before the therefore is foundational. He made them from the beginning male and female. So this intergendered, intersexual relationship is very important for the marital bond. It's, it's critical. It's right there. And, that, and Paul is appealing to that in 1 Corinthians 7 when he says, only for a time, only by agreement, right? Because a husband doesn't have authority over his body. His wife does. Right? Same with the, the wife in terms of the husband's authority in her life. So this is right at the heartbeat uh, of that, and Jesus draws attention to that. So when there's adultery, when there's sexual immorality, that's a serious violation of the, of the covenantal bond. It doesn't make divorce necessary, but Jesus says it, it's permissible. It's permissible. Because it violates something right at the heart of what that bond is about uh, together, the intense intimacy of that bond. So when we come to Paul, uh, Peter, tonight is there tea or there is tea tonight? You guys are amazing. You're fantastic. Yeah, this is like a full service church. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 7, Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7 and then we'll, we'll break for tea. 1 Corinthians 7. Paul understands the character and purpose of marriage as covenantal interdependency for the purpose of bearing the divine image together to produce life, blessing, and shalom. <coughs> and so he prioritizes the permanence of the marital covenant. Even for those married to unbelievers, he understands that marriage has divine power, divine sanction, as possibly an, as an instrument of peace and of salvation. We saw that in 1 Timothy 2, um, uh, our first night together. So look what he says here um, in verse 12. To the rest I say, I and not the Lord, because the Lord didn't speak to this in the Gospels. So Paul is dealing with this new reality as Gentiles are coming into the church that sometimes one of the partners becomes a Christian and is already married to another. And Paul has a principle in 1 Corinthians 7, and the principle is remain as you are. If you're single, remain single, right? And if you're married, remain married even if to an unbeliever, right? unless uh, they abandon the marriage. So notice what we have here. Um, if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. And this again is going back to Genesis 1 and 2, the heartbeat of the human calling and vocation of image bearing. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. The unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. And this is really important. We're going to come back to this later tonight after our break. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Now, what is Paul talking about? I just want you to be thinking about this. We're not going to answer it right now. Is he talking about are they saved? Are they converted? No, he uses the word unbeliever, so that can't be what he means, right? But he's saying something about their status. You know, he uses the word unclean. In the Old Testament, you couldn't come to worship if you were unclean. You had to go through sort of this purification process, right? So what he's talking about is that 
they have a status in relation to the church that basically if there is one believing partner in a household Paul is viewing it as a Christian marriage and that the husband or the wife in that household and the children in that household have access to the means of grace in a way that other unbelievers do not have and it is a sanctifying influence in their life <coughs> that it it gives them access to the means of grace and that is to be a blessing to them in fact it's to be a an instrument of peace so much so that Paul raises the question here at the end in verse 16 wife how do you know whether you will save your husband or not husband how do you know whether or not you might save your wife and Peter has the same thing in first Peter 3 doesn't he, he talks about how without a word an unbelieving I mean a, a believing wife could be an instrument of the gospel to her unbelieving husband right so there's something very powerful about marriage that God intended from the beginning right to be at the heartbeat about what we're about as human beings as image bearers of God that God uses between believing spouses and unbelieving spouses that the means of grace and access to those means of grace have a sanctifying influence if we as God's people are doing our part or are taking part in that are shepherding that process it's not foolproof it's not a, it's not a promise right that they'll become a Christian but notice Paul's confidence in the power of marriage and Paul's confidence uh, of it as an instrument of peace uh, through the believer to the to the other one he also understands however and this is where we'll uh, end before our break that peace that he uses in verse 15 <coughs> requires willingness on the part of both consent active not passive posture in marriage therefore if an unbeliever separates divorces leaves the brother or sister is no longer bound so let's look at verse 15 because this is the second criteria for grounds for divorce if the unbelieving partner separates let it be so in such cases the brother or sister is not bound or enslaved now Paul's going to use a synonym for that verb uh, over in verse uh, 39 a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives but if her husband dies she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord right so this notion of the, the brother or sister being uh, free uh, is a very important thing that we see in verse 15 he goes on to say God has called you to peace God has called you to peace now in Romans 12 it's really interesting and this verse uh, was just so important in my own journey the Lord really used this passage notice what Paul says uh, in verse 18 of Romans 12 if possible so far as it depends on you live peaceably with all so notice again this idea that peace requires willingness requires consent right and that the purpose of marriage is shalom it's to bring shalom into the world bring life blessing peace to be an instrument of peace right so the second grounds for a biblical divorce according to the New Testament is separation or abandonment by an unbeliever of a marriage now that presents us with some some real challenges and I think it's just it's really what motivated me tonight to focus on this whole subject because of why shepherding is so important how are we to know if someone is an unbeliever or someone who professes to be a believer who is involved in the church and if they continue to act as an unbeliever how can we know when we might be free to remarry or not right it it really brings into sharp focus one of the reasons why the shepherding ministry of the church 
is so important for those going through marital crisis. This second grounds for divorce, right? Now, the first grounds as well because what heartbreak, what wrenching heartbreak, what could be more heartbreaking, right, than betrayal in a marriage? So what we see in terms of both of these severe ruptures of the marital bond is how significant, how important shepherding is. And we're going to talk more about the discipline process and how it has an important role to play, and yet we often get it so wrong. We often do it so poorly that I think it'd be good for us just to spend a little time thinking about it in the second half tonight in terms of its role in helping those going through marital strife and marital breakdown uh, to see what the Lord is up to in our lives. So let's take a, a break for tea. Uh, Peter, it was about, about 10 minutes, is that right? Okay. They're scones. We say scones in America. Scones. That's right.